stay true to who you are from the very beginning and just, and, and, and don't waver from it. And also don't have fear that like maybe that stance isn't right. And there's all kinds of point, you know, you can be super like pro environment. You can do this. That's totally cool. I think as long as you're consistent, um, like you're going to attract the people that you want to attract. And, and remember, we went to that e-commerce convention in San Diego, and I thought one of the coolest points one of the guys made was he said, um, try not to butcher this, uh, you, your consumers don't choose you, you choose your consumers. Yeah. And that's exactly the point. Because, and that's what it's you know, boiling out for Born Primitive. It's like, hold on. We choose who wants to shop us by how we project, not the other way around. We call the shots, not them. You're listening to the Born Primitive Podcast. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Born Primitive Podcast. Big Tone, how we doing? Doing good. Good morning, Bear. Did you get pumped in this morning? No, I didn't actually. God damn. Okay. <laughs> push well, ups. Now we're, we're starting off on, on the wrong foot, Tone. It wasn't the answer. I know. All right. Uh, but so the topic for today, this is actually Tony's idea. So if it sucks, blame him. <laughs> um, but uh, today we're going to talk about just me, me and Tony. Um, Kind of the uh, if we were starting today uh, for for born primitive and just kind of taking some of the key learnings, you know, we're coming up on the ten year mark, and uh, you know, hopefully, you know, for people that are maybe starting up a business or are in the process or you know even pretty far along, uh, hopefully there's some takeaways from this. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, you you got you got to make mistakes the wrong, you know, you got to you got to learn the hard way. Um, and we've definitely done that quite a bit. So, uh, that's the intent of this. So let's roll right into it. Uh, Tony, you, you got the, uh, you got the reins, man. Cool. Well, I think the, where I would want to start is, uh, kind of in the initial startup and kind of, uh, equity side of, of a business. And of course, anyone that, anyone that goes through that or, or starts a business, their questions are gonna have to answer. Um, so a little bit loaded because I, I know a little bit obviously about our backstory, but start there. What did, what that in, what did that initial stage startup uh, look like for Born Primitive? And there anything there that you would change now in hindsight? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to you know whether to raise money or you kind of do it yourself, I think that's kind of the the root of your question. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely you need to give that a lot of thought. And I, and I I spoke at a kind of a business thing a couple of weeks ago, and I told the the guys the same thing. It, it depends on a few things. Um, one, what is your risk threshold for your own in, in your own personal financial situation? So, if your own personal financial situ, uh, if your financials are pretty squared away and you have some buffer and you are someone that is willing to take risk, I would say hold off on trying to raise money um, to start it up. Um, however, if you're someone that's kind of barely making um, ends meet and and you don't like to take risk. Um, going out and getting money from family or, you know, if it's eventually like VCL, whatever that is, um, isn't a horrible, um, option. Uh, you know, you could go get a loan at the bank. Um, you could also take a, you know, home equity line of credit against your house. Again, a lot of people would say that's super risky. Um, so I think it also depends on how confident are you in the idea? How bullish are you on it? Um, but you know, I think there's, there's pros and cons, right? So if you raise money, um, you essentially eliminate your own risk in your own finances, because typically those people are incurring the risk in exchange for a percentage of your company. Um, but, uh, but if you do it yourself and let's say you're you know, like me and you really like to roll the dice and you, you maybe take a loan out against your house. Um, if it goes South, obviously that, that is on you and there's no, just, ah, we, we tried to chalk it up as a loss. Um, so it, you know, it really kind of depends on the situation, you know, for us, you know, for those that listen to the origin episode, this might be repeat, but, uh, you know, Mal and, I, Mal and I really had no money at the time and my brother was doing pretty good on Wall Street. So I just made a phone call to him and, you know, he ended up uh, putting in 10K um, and he made me put 2K in, which was more than half of my net worth at the time because um, he wanted to have skin in the game. And, um, you know, at the time we didn't think Born Primitive was going to turn into really anything. It was this niche compression short thing that I had come up with and, you know, we didn't have grand visions for it to become what it is now. So for me, it was like, ah, I'd rather take it from my brother than put my own, you know, it, but in hindsight, I could have literally walked down to the bank and got a $10,000 loan in two seconds, right? And probably at that time pay four or 5% interest on it and probably wouldn't pay it off within a year. And then Mal and I are 100% owners. Um, so as a result of that mistake, you know, Matt became a 31% owner, which was our football number is so how sophisticated that, uh, you know, ne- negotiation was. And, uh, you know, now, you know, in hindsight, that was the wrong move. You know what I mean? So uh, I guess, you know, the bigger point is if you are going you know, to start something, 
um, put a lot of value on on the equity now because you don't know what it will become. So don't don't devalue it in your mind as oh well, it's not a business yet. And you know, um, however, if you're going to raise, they might not accept that as an answer because they haven't seen any proof of concept yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it just really depends on your situation. Um, and, uh, you, you gotta, you know, for me, I would say take risk. That's, that's what I would recommend. But for a lot of people, they'd rather let someone else take on the risk. But then of course there's higher upside for that individual who's taken on the risk. For sure. And I think there, that kind of leads into, to what I'd like to get into next, as far as you're through the startup phase or you figure out, Hey, this is, this is the cash that I need to allocate in order to get this thing running. Then once the operation's churning a little bit, I think a really unique part of Born Primitive is that there's never been any outside capital investment, which like at our size, that is extremely unique. It, it's not, it's not. I, I wouldn't say there aren't other companies to do it, but I know anytime I talk to somebody that's been in the business world, they're kind of shocked to hear that. So in hindsight now, having having been doing it for 10 years, would you replicate that playbook again? Because there's, I think you would agree, there's pros and cons to each. Uh, but but with with the hindsight you have now, is that something you would you would do the same? It's tough, man. I, I think about this a lot. Um, f- from a financial standpoint, not raising capital, um, it essentially keeps pretty much your entire net worth as an in- individual tied up into the business, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But you really haven't cashed your chips out yet. You know what I mean? Now, of course, you can take owner dividends and things like that. Like you're, you you know, it's I'm doing okay, right? But the the real liquidity of comes when you do, you know, a transaction, sell thirty to seventy or maybe one hundred percent of your company. A lot of people that are a little bit more sophisticated than we were when we started. That's the that's the intent from the beginning. They're gonna be like, all right, we're gonna raise a bunch of money, and then in four years we're gonna raise again, and we're gonna take secondary proceeds, and we're gonna raise again, and they have this ten year plan to get rich as individuals. Um, so from a, you know, I'm, I'm as capitalist as they come, man. I, I got no, I don't blame anyone for that approach. Um, we did the opposite. We bootstrapped it. Um, I didn't even know anything about private equity, any of that when we did it anyway. So if you had said those words, I wouldn't even know what, what you're talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, we always lived within our means, right? In my mind, a business always has to be profitable, right? To me, that was just such a basic thing that when you get into this world of like, PE firms and this and that. There's some really big companies out there that you guys think are the baddest companies ever, and they actually have never made money. And and they're held on a pedestal and like, oh, like Allbirds is an example. This like the darling of the direct to consumer world, right? And it's like it's you know, I don't remember what the valuation was at one point. It was something totally outrageous and everyone's pumping money into it and it's this and it's like it never made money, right? And now its stock is down 90% and all these companies that that appeared to be the play it the, the the predictions are falling through you look at we work you know that, that was the company that was like subleasing out office space yep. common space they never made money um and, and dissect that a little bit because yep. i think for the listener if you're not in this world th- like that that thought alone of like well what do you mean companies don't make money so d- dissect that a little bit because i think it's helpful. It, <laughs> And again, I'm not a PE guy, so like, but I know enough to be dangerous. The, it's the idea that all right, we're in growth mode right now, so we don't have to make money yet. We're you know we're either acquiring customers or we're building up infrastructure. If it's a software company, like they're building the software, and then eventually they'll squeeze the sponge, and, and it'll that will become, you know, the 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 bottom line will become you know profitable. Um, so a lot of times they're raising capital, they're raising capital, and every two three years they're pumping more money into it because it's under this prediction that oh at year eight we're going to make millions, right? So all these investors want to get in. When that happens, the owners get a bunch of money and secondary proceeds. Usually, you know, some of that's to be negotiated. How much does it go to the business? How much does it go to the owners? Then they get diluted, diluted, diluted. They continue to get diluted until you know they they, they own barely any of their own company. Yep. Now there's a board of directors. They're maybe sitting on the board as one individual, but there's 10 dudes on the board that, you know what I mean, are now calling the shots and likely, you know, as they should, because they've probably given you hundreds of millions of dollars. So like WeWork is an example. They raised over $15 billion from SoftBank, right? And they were never profitable ever. They, they were given, you know, 15 billion with a B and they never made money. For every dollar they were making, they were spending two. Yep. So it's like, in my mind, this fancy world of like, oh, yeah, it's like you never actually made money. You're not worth $50 billion. Stop. Yeah. And I, I would get in arguments with my friends that like work for software companies. Like, oh, our company's worth $900 billion. I'm like, well, how much has it ever made? And like, well, we lost uh, $89 million last year. I'm like, okay, well, you, you're worth zero. You're worth fucking zero. So yeah. pardon my French. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So born primitive, we were the opposite. And part of it's because I didn't know any better. But it's like, well, of course, we need to make money. We have to live within our means. 
Um, and we slowly build this thing, right? So that's why it's taken 10 years where some of these brands, they're big in two or three years because they got a check for 15 million bucks and then they can go sign the marquee athlete in the endorsement deal. And, and right off the bat, there's the perception that they're a successful brand. And it's like, no, they lost $6 million last year. They didn't, they're not actually successful, but they look like it. And the perception, you know what I mean? It yeah. becomes that <clears throat> external projection thing. And, um, and when, at what point, what year did you, did those conversations or did that start to come into your lexicon as far as like that being a possibility? Was there a time you can remember where like, cause you said when you started, yeah. that wasn't even in your vocabulary. No, I, so. You know, we thought, I, honestly, it really, we got approached by an investment bank a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and they basically were like, Hey, we've been kind of watching you guys and we think this is a great investment opportunity for a potential PE firm. Like, what do you think? And we were like, you know what, why not throw our, our hat in, in the ring and see what happens? Um, and we did go through that process and we eventually, um, you know, didn't end up coming to a deal, um, but learned a ton. You know, we were in it for about a year and uh, got to kind of see what our business was worth and talk to these professional investors and, you know, learn a lot about the company uh, as far as how others perceived it from a, from a valuation standpoint, which was really cool. Um, but until those guys approached us, it hadn't even crossed my mind. Um, so, so would you now in hindsight, let's say you hit that let's say you hit like the six or seven year mark, and I know the numbers associated with that, yeah. would you now look to maybe, hey, if I can bring on a strategic partner that I know is aligned with our brand values, would you look to do something like that? Or do you still kind of knowing, knowing kind of the that landscape now, do you actually have respect and also would repeat the way you went about it uh, this first time? It, in hindsight, yes, I think I would have done it earlier because and of course you can never time the market, but during like COVID and the direct to consumer boom for businesses like us got crazy. And you had all these brands like us that were in that game, getting tons of money that they shouldn't have been getting um, because everyone was like, oh, this is the new boom. And it was a temporary boom, COVID was, right? It was this giant like 18 to 24 month thing that was an outlier, but businesses were benefiting from it from a valuation standpoint because all these PE firms wanted to pump money into them, right? Yep. So these valuations, these brands like us that were similar to us were getting were outrageous. Um, but we weren't in the game yet and we got in at the tail end of it and then everything, you know, uh, went horrible. You know what I mean? The economy took a shit. Um, inflation got crazy. The banks started getting freaked out because, you know, the Silicon Valley Bank tanked and all these other, you know what I mean? It, it literally became yeah. the worst market for deals which is ultimately why we didn't end up coming to one because it just wasn't the right environment for it. But in hindsight, yeah, if I could have like looked back, if I had the crystal ball, I would have timed it perfectly with COVID. Um, and, you know, that can do two things if done right. Number one, for the owners, it's an opportunity to make a ton of money. Let's just call it out what it is. Yep. That's 100% what it is. But number two is hopefully there's another bite at the apple, right? So you bring in a strategic partner that can bring in unique capabilities that helps you get to the next level. And then hopefully in five years, you do it all over again and you sell another chunk of the company. And that's how they make their money. But then, you know, once again, there's proceeds to owners. And um, if there's any other shareholders, of course, everyone, everyone gets paid. For sure. So in hindsight, yes. Um, but I think it's worth calling out the dangers of this. And we've talked about a little bit in other podcasts, but a lot of these, a lot of our competitors took the op opposite approach. It was like, raise money, raise money, raise money, raise money. I mean, I can't confirm this, but, and I, again, I'm a capitalist, so I can't, I can't hate on it. I'm just calling it out. One of our biggest competitors, Noble, as I was told until their last deal had raised over a hundred million dollars in the same time period we've been in business. Right now, when you look at Noble, it's like, oh, the NFL combine, they got all these CrossFit PGA. Games champions, the PGA, you know, and you're like, oh, damn, like they're killing it. And again, I'm a capitalist. I'm sure those owners, because through every one of those capital raises, probably made a ton of money. So I, I applaud them for it. The, the plan worked. However, if you look at some of the politics of Noble, their, their brand identity over time, you could kind of see it in my mind change. This is just my opinion as, a, as an observer over a six or seven year period. There were things that began to change that you can begin to scratch your head on of like, huh, that doesn't line up. You know what I mean? And, th and that's the dangers of private equity because you start getting people on your board that start now you're not in charge anymore. So now when they want to push maybe a woke narrative or this or that, all of a sudden it's like, hey, move out of the way. This you're is what you're doing. You're like, wait a second. This is my brand. And like, no, you're not. We just gave you 40 million bucks. Shut the hell up. Right. Yeah. And I, I can't again, I'm not in that organization, um, but. Some of the athletes they fired because, you know, one guy was like, you know, again, I can't confirm this, so take it for what it's worth. But how he, he started getting into guns, right? And he had some skepticism on COVID, right? 
and they shit can them, right? And it's like, okay, got it. And, and then, you know, so you know what I'm getting at, yeah. right? That's the risk. And, and that's, um, and we're actually going to have a really cool episode in the future. We're bringing in the president of Anheuser-Busch and we are going to explain to you all why all these companies have gone woke and it, it will finally make sense. There's a reason for it. And yeah. it's not because everyone actually wants that. There's a, there's a, nothing. so stay tuned to that one. But former president of Anheuser-Busch is coming in. We're going to interview him. And it's going to be a fascinating episode, but we'll get more to what we're talking about. So I kind of went long on that, but, but long story short, be careful who you're doing business with, because if you're doing it just to raise money, there's going to be people with other um, agendas that are now going to be running your company. And for us and for me, and this is, you know, when we go to raise money it probably in a couple of years, that it will be damn clear on day one in those negotiations that born primitive will always be born primitive. And you're, if you're trying to buy 70%, probably not going to happen because like it still needs to have our DNA. Yeah. Right. And I'm not having some guy in a suit in San Francisco or New York telling us that, Oh, now you need to do this and that. No, we're going to be pro uh, military pro first responders. We're always going to reject the victim bullshit that's getting pushed in our society. You'll never see the opposite coming from born primitive unless someone buys hundred percent of the damn thing, which I don't think we would ever do um, unless there was an arrangement that still allowed me to stay in control of that part of the brand. Yeah. So for me, there's a moral side to it even though maybe I'm an idiot for doing that. Um, but for me, it's like, you know, what's the, what's the freaking point at the end of it if you're just going to sell out? And, you know, imagine if Born Primitive did a 180 on, our, on who we were. Yeah. Because you got a guy that lives in San Francisco who got an MBA from Harvard all of a sudden is trying to say, oh, well, you know, next year this is our marketing plan and these are our pillars of who we are. And we're like, it's the complete opposite. We'd lose all of our people. Yeah. And then they'd say we were sellouts. That's never going to happen. So. Well, and I think there, there's a perfect segue into – Another thing that like if you were to start today and I think this one is less like, oh, uh, in hindsight, I would have done this different because I think you and Mal and, and the brand as a whole has done a great job of this of kind of maintaining core values and setting setting a personality from the beginning that's true to who you are and also true to what you think that like kind of like what your values as an individual, then also what the market will, will respond to. And then building the brand on top of that and kind of being unwavering. That doesn't mean you need to be rigid, but sticking to those values. And as you just said, like when you see it, when companies will take on uh, investment, all of a sudden their personality shifts to something new. So walk me through kind of those initial setting the personality of the brand and then also any advice you would give to somebody, hey, who, who is starting something and kind of defining who they are and then sticking to that over time. Yes. Good question, man. Um for us, the easiest way to do it was the values of the brand reflect the values of us. So it was Mal and I. It was just our personality projected onto a brand because a, a brand, when, when well-constructed, is a brand that almost personifies a human being and has traits of a human, right? Yep. And you can identify it, you know what I mean? Um, and you stay true to those values over time and you be consistent because that you know creates validity that you are who you are. Um, and uh, so for us, you know, it was from day one. Um, you know, we always said we wanted to use our platform to give back. We've definitely honored that. I mean, we're approaching 2 million and to date donated, which is wild considering, you know, we're not that big of a company. Um, but Hey, that was some, put your money where your mouth is, you know, you got to man up and, and do that. So we did that, um, unapologetically patriotic, you know, we've been true to that. You know, I served for eight years, you know, for while we were a company. So not only were we saying it, I was doing it because I thought that was important. But then, you know, we used our, our platform to give back to all those veteran and, and first responder organizations as well. So with that, and then there's the kind of the mentality side of Born Primitive. And that was a kind of a cut against the grain of, again, the victim mentality that's getting pushed in our society, the lack of personal responsibility, and just the, the acknowledgement that, hey, anything in worth, worthwhile in life requires hard work and sacrifice. And if you're not willing to do that, the world owes you nothing. And that's as simple as it is. And we were like, th those are kind of the pillars of who we're going to be. I mean, this is when we're selling compression shorts out of the Jeep at CrossFit <laughs> events in Indianapolis. It really was, right? Yeah, and yeah. thank God, you know, the only reason I, I had enough, like, knowledge to come up with those traits is because I, had been, I was working for Red Bull at the time. And Red Bull, like, gave you the personality traits of who, like, Red Bull was. They're one of the best. Actually. Yeah, exactly. So I kind of learned, oh, like, that's what right looks like. Now, of course, our personality traits were different. Yeah. But we had to memorize the, and if any marketing thing or messaging you did that didn't align with those traits with Red Bull, like the marketing team would reject it because like, hey, cool idea, but that's not on brand, right? It doesn't, how does that align with one of the, the traits? Ideally, you get multiple traits. So that's kind of what trained me in the beginning. Like, all right, I have to come up with my personality traits. And it was like, well, I don't want to invent a human. So like, 
I think I'm just going to do me. Yeah. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it's a little bit of a cop out, but, yeah. um, so I think it's important on day one, you come up with what that is and, and where I'm going to get to like, what would we do different? I wouldn't necessarily say we'd do anything different, but there were times, especially early on. And for those that have listened to the podcast might've heard this kind of sentiment already, but you kind of question sometimes, um, you know, should we, should we tone it down a little bit? You know what I mean? Are we, are we too patriotic or like, especially when society started getting weird and it has been, and you know, and I will now talk shit on that as I mean, I don't, I don't give a damn. Like I'm, I'm now, t- I'm so, so confident that we are on the right side of this and in the, in the common sense approach to this is way more received than the media makes it out to be. But, you know, as you remember, a good example was like, during the BLM craziness, right? And, and we were like, holy shit, you know, they're burning buildings down, they're invading police precincts, they're taking over, you know, town squares. And like, it's one of those things where like, if you said anything against that, you were labeled this person. And it's like, wait a second. And and it, it, it was in a way where, you know, we ironically had our new Thin Blue Line collection coming out, as you remember, like in like a, like what, I don't know, six weeks after all that went down. Yeah. And we're in the thick of it. And I remember we had a meeting and it was like, oh, shoot, should we not launch our Thin Blue Line collection? Because is that going to rock the boat and this and that? And um, for the listeners, like a a good chunk of the sales of that collection actually goes to a police charity that supports um, the families of fallen officers. So it's a pretty cool cause. Obviously, we've supported the police since the beginning. And, you know, I'm not going to get into like the the, the stuff that happened, but we have over, I think, a million police officers in this country. And in my mind, it was like to villainize the entire police and in this entire country is pretty effed. Like, you know what I mean? Like, obviously, every organization has bad apples and we can fix stuff. But of course, to just all of a sudden villainize our entire entire police and defund them. I mean, it's so funny. I don't want to get the defund thing. How many of those people are eating their words now, right? It's like some of these cities that defunded their police and now they're trying to get them all to come back. It's like, if you're a police officer, like, what would you say? Oh, now you want me back because the city's a shit show now and crime has gone up 80%. So, but what I'm getting at is in the moment, you know, when, when your entire, you know, company's success kind of relies on how it's perceived by the consumer, these are hard conversations. And I remember in the meeting, we sat in here and we were like, hey, what do you guys want to do? And I think we kind of said, hey, let's let's kind of like go on standby for a minute and kind of see what plays out. But things continue to get more volatile, more shit's getting burned down, more crazy protests. And we're like, this ain't getting any better. This is actually getting worse. And then a couple of our employees who are former police officers kind of brought it up and they were like, kind of like, hey, what the hell? Like, are we born primitive or not? Yeah. You know what I mean? If, if someone's going to not shop born primitive because we support police, do we even want them as a customer? And the obvious answer was hell no, right? But it took a little bit of like, that was a little bit scary because that was such a volatile moment. And it's one of those things you just don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, well, if you're going to try to, you know, project this message that you're unapologetic, you know, you're not going to apologize for who you are and you're going to stick to your guns. Like you're kind of bitching out a little bit on that in in a moment where you're really being tested. And that's, you know what I mean? When especially us where like that was a founding pillar of what you and Mal created is first responder, the police, the firefighters. So it wasn't either because you do see some hacky brands who kind of just jump in all of a sudden. You know I mean? They're kind of chasing. They know that, I mean, this is well known in marketing. It's like you want some people to hate you, some to love you. And that's actually pretty healthy. So you will see brands just kind of jump in on one side or the other when that hasn't been a founding principle of their brand. But for you got for us, man, like that was that was a moment where it was like it was a check on like, are we who we say we are? Hey, everybody, just want to interrupt the podcast super quick, let you know uh, that we have a leggings flash sale going on right now uh, for a few more days. Uh, so all leggings are fifty dollars uh, from a specific collection. Um, but to sweeten the deal, I think you've heard about this already on, on the previous podcast, but If you buy any legging from us for the entire month of January, you will receive a voucher to buy a $50 pair of leggings for every month after January. So on Feb 1st, March 1st, et cetera, you'll get an email to say you have the option to redeem another $50 pair of leggings. So it essentially gives you that that option for the remainder of the year, kind of a cool incentive we're doing. So this would be a great opportunity to do it given a a legging splash sale is going on. You only have to buy one pair uh, and it'll end in a couple of days. So if you want to take advantage of that, Get on it, bornprimitive.com, and uh, back to the podcast. And, and I'm not going to lie, man. <laughs> part of the reason I'm more comfortable with it now, and part of the reason, I mean, for those that caught the censorship episode, you know, in December, like, <laughs> I didn't hold back. I'm a little less afraid. 
part of that is because I've diversified my own finances that if Born Primitive were to end tomorrow, I could retire. I'm good. I've, I got, I've, I've pivoted to real estate. I, you know what I mean? I have that thing going. So for me, it's like I, I'm kind of playing with house money now, but that doesn't mean I'm reckless, but it, it's allowing me to not be afraid because before it was like, that's the only gig. I mean, I, I mean obviously I was active duty. I had, I had another job, but I mean, it was like, we are all in on this. So whether it's right or wrong, part of my my comfort level of doing that it was I was nudged in that direction because it's it's I'm not relying on it financially anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that's right or wrong, just between you and me, that's yeah. that's the reason I'm like screw it. I'll do a podcast about censorship and talk shit for you know 45 minutes about the bullshit I'm seeing in society. Who cares? Yeah. What are they gonna do? Um, it, you know, half our customers leave. Cool. I mean, we're still killing it. And, you know, then people are more stoked to rep us because we actually stand for something. Yeah. And, and as I look more at the, at the, at the landscape, I see the opportunity with that approach getting bigger and bigger, the more absurd shit gets. Right. So like, I actually see it as like, um, while we're doing it for the right reasons and because it's actually what we believe there's an incredible marketing potential here because it's people are going to, are, are longing for brands to actually speak to them. And I think, you know, I haven't even told you, we got the Anheuser-Busch guy. When he comes on, the the actual like when you when he walks through the woke stuff, it's it's fascinating, man. And you, I mean, I think you know a little bit, but yeah. it's it will blow your mind because it's like you know, for me, I, I'm also a consumer, right? Like I you know see other brands and how they project, and I was just sitting there like, none of these brands represent the values that I subscribe to, and I feel like I make you know. I'm middle America, man. Like, you know, there's a lot of people that, that roll like that. And it's not controversial loving your country, you know, supporting the military first responders. That should not be a controversial angle, but all these brands were projecting the opposite. And I was like, there's something going on here because they're not representing the massive. Something else is influencing this because I know these board members, especially some of these, you know, conservative rich guys that sit on these boards, they don't actually subscribe to any of that. So who is influencing them? Yeah. Who, like, there, there has to be. And not, now I know the answer, so I'll, I'll save it. Yeah. But that episode's going to be wild. We're yeah. going to get in, and maybe we'll put our tinfoil hats on in a little bit, but it's going to be, it's cool. Yeah. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that. No, but. no, it's, it's, all, it's all good stuff. And it, I, I think if you, as a consumer, you can kind of recognize that, that, like, wait a second, how are how are all 30 of these huge companies have the same personality trait? And yeah. I, think, I think people are starting to become aware of it. And, yeah, I mean, some people say put on your tinfoil hats, but, like, <laughs> If you trace it back far enough, man, and get yeah. into the WEF and ESG, like in 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 where that agenda or influence may be coming from, it'll make you scratch your head if nothing else. So I would love, yeah, I'm excited to hear somebody who was actually in the trenches of that because I'm, I'm sure the insights are are fascinating. And how ironic is he was the former president I, I, of the Bush? I know. You know what I mean? Like it, with what happened with Bud Light, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, and just to wrap up that point, the point I was trying to make, and I went all over the place, so I apologize, guys. But stay true to who you are from the very beginning. And just and, and and don't waver from it. And also don't have fear that like maybe that stance isn't right. And there's all kinds of points. You know, you can be super like pro environment. You can do this. That's totally cool. It, I think as long as you're consistent, um, like you're going to attract the people that you want to attract. And, and remember, we went to that e-commerce convention in San Diego. And I thought one of the coolest points one of the guys made was he said, um, try not to butcher this. Uh, you Your consumers don't choose you. You choose your consumers. Yeah. And that's exactly the point because, and that's what it's, you know, boiling out for born primitive. It's like, hold on. We choose who wants to shop us by how we project, not the other way around. We call the shots, not them. Yeah. Right. So um, for anyone starting, regardless of what you want to be, right, there's so many different cool things you can align with and um, just be true to it. And don't, um, don't, don't let the kind of things that are going on in society make you question your beliefs um, and just stick to your guns. And, and if you do that, you'll have authenticity and the people that have been with you over the years are going to say, hell yeah, they've always been who they are. And that's, that's freaking awesome. Yeah. So cool. Well, yeah, we, I mean, we all over the place, but all, all, all good stuff. <laughs> I so think part of the problem is I was doing 300 shuttles right before this. So I, <laughs> What's I, the heart rate well, I hit my old, it? my old, my college strength coach up uh, Emil Johnson. And I yeah. asked him what the old standard was for the 300 shuttle test yeah. we had to do. Um, and they broke it up by skill positions and then big skill, which was like linebackers, yeah. tight ends, and then big, which is the, the big uglies up front, the linemen. And, uh, and he sent me the times and they have the, you know, at, at One Life, they have the, uh, the, the turf track yeah, yeah. or the turf strip. So I was hitting 300 shuttles, man. Can you still maintain it? I, dude, I'm close. I'm close. I, I, I can't turn as fast as I used to. I used to I used to make up a lot of ground on the turns because I, yeah. I was never that fast, but 
on the turn, I could I could stop Pop on a off. dime, and I don't have that turn anymore, man. So I'm slugging it out. It uh, is trying the, to the, the explosive yeah. side of things, man. If you don't train that for a while, then you get like plyos or like running, <laughs> exactly. and you go to move fast. You're like, Oof, yeah. I don't have what I used to. But I do want to like uh, formally retest it because for me, it's like one of those things. It's it's kind of just for my own personal like. All right, I can still hang. But yeah. it's it's just me finding stupid ways to motivate myself I, to train. I'm the same so, way. Yeah, I'm cool. blaming it on the shuttle. Yeah, so Coach yeah. Johnson. Uh, I'm blaming it on you. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. The the next one that I think is really relatable too, or or in even my myself can speak on this a little bit, but just curious your thoughts is kind of I wrote it down as just day one traits, meaning like let's let's teleport back to you and Maurer starting born primitive. What are what are some traits or skills that like okay, you're you're you got the brand, you got the personality down, you got the 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 equity and the the cash to to get it rolling from an inventory standpoint. What are the what are the traits that you as an individual would want to develop just knowing kind of now what's coming? Uh, obviously, now that you have 10 years in the game. Um, so not a ton, because I don't want people to think you have to have this super polished arsenal of skills to start a business. Because I think if people are scrappy and they're resourceful and they just they're persistent, they'll they'll they can make it work. Um However, I think looking back, the one skill I would have liked to have is a more basis in just accounting. Um, you know, I could have taken some accounting classes in college. Um, I didn't because I knew they were going to be hard and I can take easier classes that would give me the same credit, right? Yeah. Um, but just having a basis in kind of accounting and finance, I think would be huge. Um, so if I could do it all over again, I would have done at least a class or two in college. And then like, you know, there's books you can buy that, you know, it's like accounting for dummies and shit. It, as dry as it is to understand that would be critical um, because here's the irony of us. And this is like ridiculous. I'm almost like, a, you know, ashamed to admit it. But given that we've made it work, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll admit it openly. You know, we've never set a budget ever. Not, we're coming up on 10 years. We've built up 100 million plus enterprise and we have not set a budget once. We've never rolled into the year been like, all right, what's our marketing budget? Like literally we've winged it. And it was like, it literally the criteria was, okay, is this on brand and does it, does it make sense? And if it was, that was it, we'd thumbs up it, roll out, let's see what happens. And I do not recommend that <laughs> approach to literally anyone. It worked for us. Um, it was kind of like, just Which is follow your gut, follow, follow the gut, follow your heart, see, you know, do good things. Um, ironically, we have our first ever like real, real budget meeting, you know, you're going to be in that. So bring the coffee. Yeah. Um, we got what we're going to do it for like nine or 10 hours next week. And we're locking in 2024. Um, that is a much needed professionalization of the company. Um, so the, the fact that I didn't have an accounting and finance background, I think was a big part of that. Also being the fact I was active duty running around doing all this, like, you know what I mean? Mal and I was like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. Let's do it. You know what I mean? We weren't ever like, well, what's our event budget this year? And like, how much have we spent? And like, you know what I mean? It was like, there was none of that. Never. Yeah. Um, we didn't even have a cash flow projection sheet for like until like a few years ago, which is like, you know, helps you to when you have orders coming in that you have to place, you know, for these incoming inventory orders and you have to have a lot of money on standby to, to, you know what I mean? Like, is there money in the bank? Yes. Yeah, do exactly. That, yeah, was, no, that was the, dude, it was, and yeah. it was, and there was always enough because again, we were doing well, but we were living within our means. So it didn't make us be reckless. And that's the, that's the iron, irony of like a lot of these people that raise a bunch of money. Let's say they get a check for 30 million bucks and let's say 10 of it goes to the business, 20 goes to the owners. And then the private equity guys are like, all right, you have to deploy this 10 million in the next two, three years to grow the business that requires you to have like a really dialed in thing. Like it, it forces you to professionalize because like you're now dealing with professional investors and like, they're not going to let you be like, ah, Hey buddy, uh, New York guy. I just, I just roll with it. Yeah, so like, yeah. I, you know, I just, I need you to trust me that 10 million is going to go to a good place. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Um, but what a lot of times these companies end up not being profitable because they, they have to, they feel like they need to deploy the capital and it's not for things. So like, that's why some of these entities, you see them sponsoring these big things, and I'm shaking my head like they ain't making shit on that. Like no it return. looks cool and, and they get pressed, but they're getting their ass handed to them on profit right now because they just spent way too much than they should have. And I'm not going to name names, but they're out there yeah. where we were the opposite. So, um, you know, I think establishing the budget is so critical um, and just we got away with it, but we are an outlier. Like the, the fact that like you know, I didn't even know what, you know, EBITDA was. That's the fancy term for profit until like a couple of years ago. How, yeah. You know what I mean? We were just so in it. Just, just so. Well, and I think too, yeah. it like when, when you start, 
not that it's not already complicated just because like even five years ago, you, Born Primitive was doing real numbers, but as you start to build out departments without those financial like kind of base structures in place, you lose a level of objectivity that allows you to operate. And yes. we, we realized that in yeah. the last couple of years is like, yeah, finance can be dry at times, but it gives you a level of just pure data and objectivity as far as the decisions you're making so that when, when things maybe start to, to not rip like they used to, you can very quickly be like, oh, well, here's the leaky source where we're losing money. Whereas for us, it's like things had ripped in, in you guys in Born Primitive and us even today. Marketing, I, I would always call one of the strengths of the brand is yeah. that like, whereas the finance was not a strength, the marketing side was always such a strength that like we had expanded into so many avenues. But then when that slight reckoning came and we had to identify like, wait a second, why, why is our profit margin drop or why is our EBITDA dropping? It's like, well, you're looking around and shit's shotgun all over the place. Whereas yeah. like if you have those financial systems set up from the beginning, it's crystal clear because each time you roll out a project or a new department, you make sure you kind of have those in place to, in order to track kind of the financials of that specific arm of the business. Yeah, and I think for those that don't want to be super financially savvy, which is definitely me, I'm more of a marketing gut instinct, like, you know what I mean? Like I, that's the stuff that I'm good at, yeah. not the books. Um, identify someone early on that can do that for you. And that's a general theme with building a business is find the, delegate the stuff you're really bad at, but make sure they're trusted people that can um, really plug that gap. So for us, my oldest brother, Mike, was our CFO technically for like, you know, the first however many years, but he had a really demanding consulting job in Chicago doing financial consulting. So like he, was he our CFO? Technically, yes. But like I'd get finances, financials from like January and like mid-April telling us like how much we made in January. So like, how are you making, by that time, that's old news. And like, you need to adjust course quickly if you, you know, if you miss projections or this and that. And so, you know, you remember we went from like 30 some employees to like 70 in like a year, right? If we had a, a, a like if Mike was a full time CFO, like a normal CFO would be doing, he would have been pulling the reins back on us being like, no, you're not. I yeah. know you want 70, but like I'll give you 40 and that's it. Yeah. And then, you know, so we were just like, you know, again, go, just going for it. And oh, yeah, that, let's bring that person on that person on. Let's do this. Let's do that. And let's sign that athlete. And and, the, and, and I think what it does that the last thing I'll say on the financial part it provides clarity for a lot of your departments. You know, athlete marketing would be a good one. Now, Claire, you know, will know her budget, right, for 2024. So when these people, you know, agents are hitting her up saying, hey, our athlete's interested in signing with you, blah, blah, blah. She knows right off the bat whether it's even a starter or not because if she's already kind of at her salary cap, we, you know, you, that's, she knows the answer is no. Um, but if she's like, well, shoot, I got X amount of money left in the budget, then she might come into my office and say, hey, this person I think is a good fit. What do you think about it, right? Yeah. Rather than with no budget, every one of those she doesn't know what to think. So it's 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 we owe it to our employees to give them the right guidance of like what their left and right limits are and the parameters of their, their department. Otherwise, it's like, how the heck do you expect them to read your mind on how to make decisions? For sure. So it's a little ridiculous when you think about it. But we're getting there. Uh, the, you know, Tony, like I said, bring the coffee next week. We're going to lock it in. And it, it only took us 10 years, man. And, when, and you can, <laughs> and you can treat yourself as that too, in the sense of like, I know as I've gotten a little more savvy, by no means an expert on the financial front is you learn that like as an individual and as me as a family now with two kids, like, Hey, treat yourself as a little business. Do you know what I mean? Cause like, as, as you take on expenses and stuff, it's easy to be yeah. like, Oh, there's money there. And then all of a sudden you start to look and you're like, Oh shit. Yeah. So like, so just having general yeah. systems in place, yeah. like I said, it gives you a level of objectivity as to kind of where things are trending and, and hopefully that's for the good. But we definitely had to go through some learning lessons when, when things turn a little bit, ours was never in an insanely bad spot, but definitely, definitely a reckoning had to happen of like, no, these systems need set up now. Yeah. And I, and I think the other side of the coin you know, that would be the one skill i'd say would help other than that man I, I i think i don't want people to have this perception in their mind if they're thinking about starting a business that that, that they're not cut out for it because they don't have the skills or oh maybe they didn't go to college like they're not smart enough or all that's crap man um you don't need the skills like obviously if you have had certain life experiences or been exposed to certain you know educational systems, whatever, you, you might have an advantage, but anyone can get in the mix and start something and, and it's never going to be perfect timing. Um, it, you know, you don't have to have an MBA from Harvard or the Ivy League degree and this fancy stuff. N none of that matters um, because it's it's kind of, in my mind, business is a lot more street smarts than like what you, what you learn in books. Like, you know, I studied political science at Yale. Like I didn't 
none of that other than learning how to write, like I said, like was is applicable at all to what I'm doing right now. I'm running a clothing business. Right. So I don't want people to think, you know, if anyone's deterred by thinking, man, I'm just not smart enough or I'm not one of those guys that, you know, no, like the end that I, I, I think that's the wrong approach. Um, as we know, be careful what you're signing up for. That was one of our points I think we're going to close out with. But um, well, in there, yeah. too, it's like you can you can go too far in the weeds as far as trying to learn. OK, let, let's use you and I were actually talking about this earlier is use like the the marketing funnel, for example, like you can dork out on customer acquisition. And of course, in our world, like that's a huge part of a direct consumer business, but any business as a whole, and, and I use the flyer example, if you print 100 flyers, and it costs you $100. And you put those on cars, and you get, let's say you get five customers from those 100 flyers, your customer acquisition cost is 20. So that gives you a little model that you can know that like, hey, if I put $100 in, okay, that's I'm going to get 20 customers from that they cost $20 to acquire then that's kind of the acquisition model. Then you have the retention of like, okay, those five customers that I have now, how can I keep them in my ecosystem so that they stay in there and that I'm making money from them over a time so I don't have to keep acquiring new customers? And of yep. course, that's always part of the model. Then a, a number we always use is lifetime value is, okay, those guys that I keep in here, how long do they stay? And with those three numbers alone, whether you're running a, a lawn mowing business or yep. you're doing what, our, what we're doing, if you know those three numbers, you can start to set up a model of, okay, how many customers do we have to acquire? What is the cost going to be associated with that? How much or what efforts and what is it going to cost to retain them? And yep. then on average, how long do they stay in our ecosystem? And those are all just really good health indicators of, of any style of business. And that's, I say that because as you said, it's like, you don't need an MBA to start to understand those things. But if you can go into a, a venture or a new business uh, opportunity, which is based knowledge on those things, it's like, you're going to be at least viewing things through the right lens. Yeah. hundred percent. It's just a big math problem. Yep. Um, and, uh, and that can potentially help you reverse engineer the, you know, to, if you're trying to build to a certain size and you know, let's say it's annual revenue, let's say you're a car wash, you're starting up a car wash and you're like, all right, we want to get to half a million a year in annual revenue, right? You work backward on that math problem. Yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? Um, and uh, as far as lifetime value, like how, how many times are they coming back, what they're spending after you acquire them? That depends on, okay, how good is the service you're providing? You know, or if it's a product, how good's the product? But uh, for us, it's product and service, right? So yep. it needs to be a good product, but then hey, let's say they need to swap sizes or they call customer service. It needs to be a great experience and that will contribute to them being loyal. But then it's like you throw in the brand personality components and then they're like, oh, hell yeah, they just donated 100 grand to veteran charities on Veterans Day. Like, boom. So it, it all kind of gets blended together yep. and that projects out what we call lifetime value, right? In, in brand loyalty. So um, it is funny. Yeah, the, the, I love the flyer example. I mean, that was me, dude, after yeah. I graduated. <laughs> I was mowing lawns again. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, Freaking, yeah. you know, this, this supposedly fancy Ivy League degree, and I'm mowing lawns, yeah. you know, in jean shorts and, uh, <laughs> you know, putting flyers in mailboxes. Yeah, it works. It works. <laughs> that was my first lesson in, in uh, customer acquisition. Cool. Well, the only, the only other, uh, the, the last topic I want to get into before we do kind of the know what you're signing up for is, I wrote it down as shiny object syndrome. Uh, and I know in my time here, and you and I have talked about kind of past moments where this may have been the case here is that I think it's easy at times, and this is personal life and business, where like you have a success in one realm, and then instead of kind of doubling down strategy within that, you start to almost chase shiny objects to have another big moment. And I think something we realize is like, it's almost the 80-20 rule that like 20% say of our products are driving 80% of the revenue. It's like, well, why the hell did we expand out that extra 80% of SKUs in order to, or products in order to get there. And I think, the, and, and that's, that's not to say that you don't want to be like chasing down new things, expanding kind of your strategy, expanding your product offering. But I, I've seen it in us at times that like you almost become neurotic with like trying to hit all these home runs where it's like, hey, you know where you just hit a home run, replicate that over and over and double down. And then if success there starts to dry up, then maybe pivot. But I think for us, we kind of were pivoting all over the place, which had its benefits, but definitely a drawback when you look at personnel and kind of time spent to yeah. make those happen. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it, it's funny when you look at all, I think we have over a 1000 products now, definitely more than a 1000 now with outdoor and tactical launch yeah. and shoes and all that. Um, but it all boils down to <laughs> top three out of five every year, a pair of black leggings, man. We make really good leggings, um, and it's one of our highest LTV item. So we're able to track um, what someone's lifetime value is based on the first product they ever buy with Born Primitive. If a girl buys a pair of our black go-to leggings 2.0, we know they're going to say these are insane, and they're going to come back a lot, right? 
So all these other products we spend time on and all these fabric swatches and this and that, it comes back to, you know, what are you really, really good at? And, and I absolutely think an argument can be made for just staying super focused and being really careful on, on feeling the need to expand outside of just, you know, being, it's like you, you look at like a company like, you know, like a stance socks, right? Or the what's the Bobas? Uh, yeah, bom- oh, Bombas. Bombas. Yeah, it, you know what I mean. It's like okay, a billion dollar company. exactly, <laughs> and it's like that's a gla- great example, great company. I think um, you know I have their products. It seems like good product. Yeah. I don't know their financials, but it's like they got super focused. They're like, hey, we're gonna be the best at socks. Yeah, and that's it. And they're gonna be stretchy and antimicrobial and all these things. And boom. And uh, well, what about nope? We're doing socks. You know what I mean? And then I know Stance eventually did like underwear and stuff like that, yeah. but. Uh, that's a good, that's a good, you know, that, that's a, that's a justification that you can be hyper-focused and still build massive businesses. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great point because then eventually these other things can be distractions. Now, I think there's something to be said for, um, not being afraid to, to take a shot down field on some of these things. Like for, sure. for us, that was outdoor tactical savage one, even this podcast, well, maybe not as big, but it's one of them. Yeah. I mean, this wasn't cheap to kind of build and it takes a lot, you know, not a lot of our time, but here we are on a Friday doing it when we could be doing other stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's a time and a place, but absolutely. Um, don't, don't think as soon as you've kind of conquered one, it's on to the next because you can probably double down and really build something substantial. Um, and your operation will be way simpler as a result. Right? Yeah, that's the, 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 the ripples that it's not it's not just the decision itself that if it if it ends up not being a home run, it's like all the ripples that are created from the, as we said, the personnel, the the financials that, that have to make that or bring that to life. Yeah. Cool. Well, last one, and we already teased it, is kind of the know what you sign up for. And, and I, I'm going to obviously turn this one over to you <laughs> because uh, you, you were in those beginning stages. And I think you've told some on the podcast before, just some funny stories of you and Mal. But I think that is it, it gets glorified. And even myself, like you look at it as like, oh, like that, that would have been so much fun, which I'm sure for you, you you'll get into like maybe at times it was and I'm sure it was exhilarating and even taking the risk uh, definitely had the pros. But I think the cons, it's 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 a disjustice to not talk about like things to, at least to be aware of. I, I wouldn't even consider them cons, just things to have in your uh, lexicon when kind of starting up, starting up or, or getting going. Well, yeah, quick three before the two be- quick ones before we get to kind of know what you're signing up for is one. We talked about this before, but celebrate the wins, mm-hmm. right? Don't be so competitive and so type A that you can't when you when you when you get to these you know mini milestones or they, maybe they're not even that many. Um, Enjoy the handiwork. Celebrate with the team. Um, don't just be immediately on to the next. It's kind of like, you know, you see like a coach after a big win and they're like, hey, we're going to celebrate tonight. We're going to drink some beers. It's going to be a good time. But then tomorrow morning, you know, 24 hours, we're back watching tape. I like that approach because that's enough time to celebrate, especially in in like a football week. Like, you know, <laughs> you got the game in a week, yeah, so you yeah. can't celebrate that long. So I think taking that approach as a business is really cool. And I think that's something we've been really bad at. So uh, that would be one, um, you know, kind of appreciate the ride. It's a little cliche, but but it is real. Um, number two, uh, don't recommend starting a business with your spouse. <laughs> Highly recommend against it. Yeah. Uh, I think some, you know, whoever listened to the origin episode, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. But uh, but that, you know, probably is maybe not sustainable. Um, and uh, particularly, you know, for the first seven or eight years, that that's all you're doing uh, together outside of your other jobs. Um, so, I would consider that uh, keeping those two things separate. And then, uh, you know, last one we talked about is just, you know, really know what you're signing up for. Um, I don't want to deter anyone from starting a business. I, I, I applaud anyone who has the courage to start it. Um, but there needs to be a brutal honesty in the beginning of, of what you're signing up for. And Tony, we might have talked about this in one of the other episodes, but this, the stats that I saw is that a startup company, there's an 8% chance of success rate. And that's not very much, right? Um, when I look back at Born Primitive, I'm, I'm almost, I'm so glad that I was dumb enough to not realize how low probability of success there was because for Mal, you know, our co-founder, um, she didn't start paying, get, you know, get collecting a paycheck for the first five and a half years. For me, it was like almost to the seven year mark that I, I, I didn't collect a penny from Born Primitive, but for the first five and a half years, it was just me and her. Right. And it was, it was, it, it consumed our life. It was the weekends. It was at night. It was in the morning. I mean, if I wasn't doing my Navy job, I was doing born primitive the other 98% of the time, or I was sleeping. Um, and, and when you just looked at it from a pure practical standpoint, it's like, okay, like if you had told me in the beginning, like, all right, bear, here's, here's, here's what you're working with. All right. 
8% chance of success. You're going to spend six and a half years. You're not going to make a penny. You're not going to have any free time. Um, it's going to lead to a divorce. Um, you know what I mean? You're going to be stressed all the time because you're going to be solving problems because you know what the hell you're doing. So you're just, you know, you're having to self-educate on like every little thing in the business. Um, yeah, I remember, you know, just from our photography, we're using like an iPhone four and Mal and I are doing the product photography in the back bedroom I've seen the with pictures. like an iPhone three yeah. and Mal was like sunburn on one of them. She <laughs> yeah. had tan yeah. lines and people were, you, yeah. you know, commenting like, what the hell? This model's sunburn. <laughs> like shit. Now we can't, <laughs> Make know, it, easy. it was like, you know what I mean? Like you, um, if someone had broken it out for me, if I, I if I had a crystal ball, I'd be like, well, that's the dumbest. I mean, no chance I'm going down that road. That's that sounds horrible. Um, so so I, I think it's just it's important, you know, depending on where you are in your life and what your risk threshold is, what your family situation is. Um, you know, I, I would I would urge a little bit of caution to just go all in and think it's going to be this this glorified, you know, oh, I'm my own my on my own boss. And there's the other thing I see people like they're like they're like the only employee, but they like want to tell everyone they're the CEO <laughs> because I think for them, it, it becomes this like thing. external validation thing. And it's like, dude, don't do it for that. If you're doing that to like try to look cool, you know what I mean? What are you CEO? So you got one employee, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like maybe technically you are, but don't, don't be putting that on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like don't be you're telling everyone, Oh, I'm the CEO of this. Oh, and then you find more. So and again, it's not to like, <laughs> hate on that but i think some people do it because they think it's this like glorified thing and when you really get in the trenches man it, it's a lonely place and it's very challenging and, and i and i know anyone who owns an own business can, can relate to this you're you're literally solving problems all the time and for us as we get bigger the problems just get bigger and you know because then people start to sue you for random shit because they see money dollar signs and it's complete bullshit but you got to spend 40 grand to defend it to just tell them to f off and then there's a tax compliance thing and then there's this and then there's an international customs and it's like you know before you know it you're like this is not what i signed up for i want to do you know i want to build a cool ass brand and do some cool stuff and like sell some good clothes and like have some fun but before you know it you know you're on settlement calls with lawyers because someone's trying you know we had some dickhead down the road try to sue us um for some stuff you know what i mean it came out of nowhere it had no basis but i had to spend 15 grand in in a couple weeks just to tell them to f off Right. So those are the problems that you're going to get that, you, you know, and that's 10 o'clock at night and you're taking a call with a West Coast lawyer yep. and you should be in bed or, you know, it, it's like that's I know people that are in my shoes can relate. Um, so I, I guess that's the only thing is just, you know, proceed with caution. Um, and if, if you're staring at the ceiling every night thinking about it, that means do it because that means like it's you're you're, you're gonna, you have to your, your guts telling you. But if you're kind of like, eh, I could go work this nine to five and get a 401k and benefits and this and that, like, hey, while you know society tries to pretend like oh like you're in the hamster wheel and all that like a consistent pay schedule and benefits and you can leave at five and not have to take work home i think there's incredible value to that 100 percent, right 100 percent. and then if you if you stay in the mix and like after 15 years you're making you know maybe like an even better living and you have work-life balance you know what i mean so you're, you're not taking a call with a lawyer at 10 o'clock at night yeah. you're not working the weekend and trying to figure out like the finances or doing this and that right so I think there's there's pros and cons to both. I, I just get a little fired up when I hear the old must be nice yeah. um, because it's like it shows how little they actually know or have been in those shoes. And that's okay. I don't expect them to. Um, but uh, it's a tough one, man. I think that was I think what you said and I actually wrote it down as you were saying it was a great call out is that if it if it's something that's bubbling up from a true place of like creativity and like you can't you can't resist the thought of bringing it to life. Then I think that at least in, in this is a this is kind of a shitty perspective for me to have because I didn't start and well, haven't founded anything but like that's the right reason whereas you said in, and I giggled when you said it because you see it all over the place is like if you're looking for that title or because you want to be a businessman or woman it's like that, that that's not the right reason and, and you're usually going to get run over or it's going to be obvious even to your consumer or people that are dealing with you that it's coming from a spot that's that's kind of disingenuous. Yeah, they want to have a sexy LinkedIn profile. <laughs> exactly. and like, so that's, it it, it kind of be I like, you know, if someone started their own military like tomorrow and they were the only one in the military, but they gave themselves the rank of four star general. <laughs> yeah. And it's like it, they're comparing, the, you know what I mean? It's like the CEO yeah. of Apple versus this. And again, it's not meant, but um, it's just like um, I, I think you got to be doing it for the right reasons. And yeah, uh, speaking of LinkedIn, I, 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 I spoke at this thing a couple weeks ago. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I haven't looked at my LinkedIn in years. Yeah. Apparently, I, and I think honestly, LinkedIn is a great platform. Yeah, you probably should. And um, and 
at this kind of thing, they, they're coached on making their LinkedIn really tight. And it's like an entrepreneurial thing. So they're like, you know, here's how to build your resume. Here's what your LinkedIn should look like. Should be super professional, all this. And they invited me to speak to these entrepreneurs about like, you know, like, you know, how, you know, about the backstory born print yeah. and try to help them out, you know, and they could ask questions, whatever is a cool thing. But then one of the girls pointed out, she was like, Hey, um, like I noticed in your LinkedIn, like you're, <laughs> you're shirtless. <laughs> You you have a Budweiser, uh, dude. I I I am I'm in front of a waterfall in Hawaii on my LinkedIn picture, yeah. shirtless. Hell yeah! And I was so embarrassed because I was like, "Yeah, guys, uh, I know this like this entity teaches you to have a really good LinkedIn, and I highly recommend it. Yeah. Don't don't like don't take after me. I am not logged into that thing in four years, and if I'm shirtless in my profile pic, I apologize. Yeah, I definitely that, don't do that. That's like being the billionaire though. <laughs> that when everyone else is dressed up, he has casual clothes on. It's like you've earned that. It's like your your yeah. thing should just say like CEO and founder of a hundred million dollar uh, company, but then it's you in a waterfall <laughs> without a shirt on. And it probably doesn't say CEO. I mean, yeah. it definitely. I don't maybe yeah. owner. I think owner is a little bit more appropriate. Yeah. Um. But uh. But yeah. I, I mean. I. I definitely have. I'm definitely guilty of, of not wearing a shirt, you know, more than I should. Yeah, so yeah. I, I was not surprised. I did not dispute her claim. I didn't have to go check my LinkedIn to validate yeah. that. Um, but uh, don't do not do that. Get a nice professional headshot. <laughs> At least that's so I'm told. And then yeah. you'll look uh, look good when employers actually look to maybe yeah. recruit you. Yep. <laughs> I cleaned mine up after TH, some people from THG. I knew we're looking at it. I'm like, all right, I'll at least make this uh, respectable. I bet you they looked at mine. And they probably oh, like, is this a real company? 100%. Is this an animal? Is yeah. it, is the, yeah. the <laughs> well, what do you think, Tone? We, do we cover down on, on some we, of the stuff? I think we did it. Well, cool, everybody. Well, well, thanks for tuning in. Um, you know, hopefully you got something out of that. And, and for any aspiring entrepreneurs, um, hopefully, you know, there's some, there's some, um, obviously some words of caution in there, but also I hope some words of encouragement that you, there's, there's never going to be the perfect time. You don't have to have some fancy degree. I think you got to have hard work and determination and some street smarts, um, and a vision on, on what you want to build. And, and on day one, you have to decide who you want to be. Um, that will give you clarity and guidance um, from that day forward, and it will make it a much simpler um, journey as far as um, when you get to this key decision points that are going to come up, you can always fall back on the values of the brand um, or the company that you've started. Um, and, I, and I think that that'll be always be kind of your, your handrail that you can follow um, and keep you on the right path. So appreciate you all tuning in. If there's any topics you all want us to dive into, obviously we are not experts. A lot of this is just off the cuff from our own experiences, but um, we would love to dive into more of any of the topics you guys want to see useful. Um, quick plug. This is uh, our co-founder Mallory wanted me to plug this um, reminder for the ladies um, month of January. If you purchase a pair of leggings all month, um, every month, February through December, after this um, on the first of the month, you will get the opportunity to buy another pair of leggings for 50 bucks. So it essentially buys you kind of a discount for the rest of the year really cool. Um, and, and the whole like reason behind this is like, we really think we have the best leggings and we were just like, Hey, let's incentivize more people to wrap them because we know, um, how much value there is and how good of a product. And then we just launched our untamed collection, uh, last week. So if you're looking for new gear, uh, you know, obviously the new year just, just happened. So if you're looking kind of for a fresh start, hard reset, um, getting some new gear never hurts. Um, so check out the untamed collection. Other than that, hope everyone has a good week guys and uh, appreciate you tuning in. Thanks, guys.